ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him, we beseech Him, and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil of ourselves. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguides, then none can guide Him. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, then none can misguide Him. Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguides, then none can guide Him or her aright. I bear witness and I publicly testify that none has the right to be worshipped in truth but Allah and that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is his slave and his messenger to proceed. Last week, Warilah Ilham, we began an introduction into our series of lectures on magic. I refrain from using the term black magic because black and white are the same. So I don't want to be accused of racism, so we say magic. Also, we said our lectures are going to be about the jinn and evil eye. Walaikum salam. Essentially about the supernatural. We gave a long introduction. I think we were a bit heavy last week because I saw lots of people fighting their sleep about why we have started this topic and its importance in our lives. Today, as promised and as advertised, we are going to start a series of lectures about the jinn. And in reading, researching, studying this topic, the more I read it, the more it realized, I realized it was important to study this topic. When you speak to young people about this topic, it's fantastic how many different ideas they have, most of them born from Hollywood. So if you ask people about ghosts, what are ghosts? They are confused. What's a ghost? I, I spoke about ghosts almost every week. What's a ghost? It's a solid death in human spirit. Excellent. It is believed to be the soul of the dead person, especially killed in a heinous crime unjustly, who has come back to that particular place where they were slaughtered, and it haunts that place. And you'll find in this society, people believe in ghosts but don't believe in God. People believe in werewolves and vampires and don't believe in God. And most of this is actually promoted by the media. We have a strange situation today. A strange cultural situation today where in the 1960s they would talk about the supernatural Dracula, the werewolf, vampires all these supernatural things then they moved away from the supernatural to science so they moved away from ghosts and spirits and spooky things to science and every justification was science so you had films like 2001 AD a space odyssey, you had the Predator, you had uh, V for Victory, you had all these science fiction films. Even Steven Spielberg. If you look at Steven Spielberg, very, very interesting evolution. And the first film is The Raiders of the Lost Ark. Am I right? They were trying to hide it, didn't see it. Well, I saw it in Jack Lear. Yeah? The Raiders of the Lost Ark is about the supernatural, where they find the fabled Ark of Musa alayhi salatu was salam. Is it Musa? No. No, it's of no. No, 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 no. They find, I forgot what it's called, my the tabernacle, that's it, of, of Musa. And they open it, the, the Nazis open it, and out come these, what look like angels that turn into spirits. That turn into spirits, and they take everybody back into the tabernacle, if I remember rightly. Do you remember that bit? Okay. He looked at me strange. Then the last film of Spielberg is about science fiction. It's about aliens who came to the earth 
and it's not magical powers anymore it's because they're aliens they have supernatural powers because they're a different race of human being they understand energy power which is more advanced than ourselves interesting isn't it but now you see science fiction and supernatural being mixed together they're mixing it together yes this is the trend so if you look at things like stranger things which is a well-known science fiction program where they spent the first series talking about about space using theories of physicists that believe they believe there's other dimensions and there's the upside down world which is you can argue science speculative so now they're mixing science fiction and the supernatural together my point here is not to go through western history about films but this informs how many young people think and see the world and one of the things we're going to be talking about is Iblis if you ask many young people who is Iblis what would they, they say to you? he's a fallen angel where do you get this idea from? it's from the Bible well I don't think it's in the Bible I think it's in the Kabbalah but it's a, it's a Christian doctrine where do Muslims get this idea? And it's surprising how much Muslims know about other religions and very little about their religion. Good example. Good example. Say, Jesus is your... See? Did you hear that? Jesus is your Lord and Saviour. Yes? Where do we learn this from? Quran? Hadith is what we hear all the time. And you say it. Young people say it. Because they hear this. And so, as an introduction to introduce what, why we are looking at this topic. And so what we're going to do is spend some lessons looking over the Islamic belief, the Islamic position in respect to the jinn. So we start with the question, what are the jinn? The jinn are a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are in a world, not meaning a physical world, no. They're in this world, okay? Because some people believe, especially from narrations that are not authentic, that the jinn have their own dimension. Yes? They have their own dimension, which they don't, which we'll see later on. They, the jinn, are different from humans and the angels. However, like human beings, they have the ability to think and to reflect. They have intellect. As humans, we have the ability to think and we have the ability to reflect, yes or no? Yes, I can make choices. I can make the choice to be good or I can make the choice to be bad. Unlike angels who always do good. Angels don't have that ability to do bad. But the jinn and humans have the ability to do good things and to do bad things. So, with this being said, we learn from the Quran that they are called the jinn because they are, are obscured from human sight. Ordinarily, ordinarily we don't see them. Yes? Does it mean we can't see them in a form they may take? And I don't want to preempt myself. But ordinarily we can't see them. Allah tells us in the Quran in Surah Al-A'raf, in the 27th verse, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلَ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ Allah tells us, indeed He sees you, He and His tribe, from where you, not, you see Him not. So Allah tells us that they can see us, strategically they can see us from a position ordinarily we can't see them. The origin of the jinn we have been told in the Quran. Allah tells us in Surah Al-Hijr the 27th verse and in Surah Al-Rahman the 15th verse. He says, وَالْجَانَّ خَلَقَنَاهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ مِنْ نَارِ السَّمُومِ Allah says, and the jinn, did we create a for time of essential fire? Allah says in Surah Al-Rahman, وَخَلَقَ الْجَانِ 
min marijim min nar. And the jinn, he did create of a smokeless flame of fire. So we see that the jinn essentially are created from fire. The smokeless flame of fire. And some of our pious predecessors, such as Ibn Abbas and Ikrimah and Mujahid and Hassan and others, they said, the meaning of the statement, Allah says, smokeless flame, is the extremity of the flame. And in another narration, it is described as the purest and best of fire. Imam an nawi said in his commentary to Sahih Muslim, the smokeless flame of fire is that mixed with the blackness of the fire. So they are made from a pure form of fire, the jinn. Unlike us, we're created of? Mud or clay, yes? As depending on your translation. However, they are made of smokeless fire. Also, we learn in a hadith recorded by Imam Muslim on the authority of our mother Aisha that the Prophet وسلم, said, the, angel, the angels were created from light, no. And the jinn were created from a smokeless flame of fire. And Adam was created from what he has been described to you. And we learn from the hadith of the Prophet wasallam that's been collected by Imam Abi Dawood, that he was made by mud. That he was made by mud. And in that hadith, the Prophet told us about the sons of Adam, that mud was taken from different parts and this explains why we have different colours and that this explains also why some of us are happy and some of us are sad, we have different temperaments. In respect to the names of the jinn in the Arabic language, there are a number of terms used for the jinn in the Arabic language. The great scholar Ibn Abdul Bar, he said, the jinn according to the scholars of the language of different types. So linguistically we're talking about, yes? Linguistically we're talking about. One, if it, one is mentioning the jinn purely of themselves, that is just about the jinn, they're referred to as jinni. Jinni. If one is mentioning the jinn that live amongst mankind, they're called amir. <coughs> whose plural is Ammar. If one is mentioning the ones that antagonize the young, they are called Arwah. And if one is mentioning the evil ones that antagonize humans, they are called Shaytan in the singular and Shayateen in the plural. And last of all, if they cause even more harm and become strong, they are called Ifrit. I'm sure you've heard that expression, Ifrit. Again, no problem. Ibn Abdul Bar says, in terms of the Arabic language, people using the Arabic language, which is a very interesting thing, because in the Arabic language, you may call somebody Shaitan, to mean they're smart and clever. The Arabs have a very common saying, they say, Shaitan Shatan. Shaitan is smart. Doesn't mean they're calling you a Shaitan, yes? But in the terms of the Arabic language, number one, if you're calling the jinni, mentioning them purely of themselves, they're called jinni. Two, if you're mentioning the jinn that live amongst mankind, they're called amir. And the plural of amir is amar. If you're talking about the jinn that antagonize the young, they're called arwah. If you're mentioning the evil ones that antagonize humans, they're called in the singular. Shaitan means one, and plural is? Shaitan, yes? And fifth, the ones that cause a lot of harm and antagonize, cause trouble, because they are strong, they're called? Ifrit, yes? If you study in the Arab world, do not be surprised if your teacher refers to the class as Ifrit, yes? Ifrit. 
That is in terms of the language. In terms of the types of jinn, the Prophet ﷺ told us in a hadith which has been authenticated by the ulama, Al-jinn thalatha asnaf. That the jinn are of three types or categories. And this is very, very important. Embarrass me, brother. <laughs> yes? So there are three types. For sirf, yatir fi hawa. So a category that flies through the air. Wa sirf, hayat. One that are snakes, wa kila, which are dogs. Wasif yahlon wa yahnoun. That is, sit one which stays in places and travels about, which we will explain in some detail. So there are three categories, yes, of jinn. And we need to be careful of these three categories because you don't know one day you may buck up, as they say, upon one of them. Yes? So here, concerning the existence of the jinn, we have two extremes. On one hand, we have the, those people, the rationalists, who deny the existence of the jinn. You have some people who say to you, brother, the jinn, come on now. Based upon Western European scientific method, they believe that those things which you can't see, you can't touch, you can't smell, they don't exist. Isn't it? Yes? You can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't smell, it doesn't exist. Western European scientific method. However, these same people are the ones who believe in atoms. Can you see an atom? Can you smell an atom? Can you taste an atom? How do they exist? I dare anybody, if I was a gambling man, because I'm a good Muslim, alhamdulillah, I don't gamble. Alhamdulillah. Find me a book on chemistry or a book on physics that doesn't go into detail about atoms. Who did GCSE over here? Nobody? Don't they GCSE? You've done it already, yes? Do you talk about atoms in school? When you were at school? Oh, yeah. You're a big man now, we know that. Yeah? You're a big man now. But in school, do you talk about atoms or you didn't talk about atoms? Little bit or in detail? Detail. Where did your teacher get all that detail from? <laughs> so they criticize us Muslims for believing in the Quran, a book, and they get their fundamental of their science from a book. Isn't it? Yeah? And I'm no scholar in science and Islam. I'll tell you a story that happened to me. Very interesting. Back in the days in the 90s, when we were very active in Dawa, some brother said to me, Brother Talib, can you come to our college and talk about science and Islam? Now, I don't know nothing about science and Islam. I didn't prepare either. So I went to this lecture. It was in the University of East London. A room, maybe from here to that wall, and as long as this room, full of people. You had Muslims, you had non-Muslims, socialist workers party, everybody was there. And I bet you they had, even you could see some older looking people who you could see, yeah, that must be a teacher of science. You wanted to see, what is this Muslim going to say about science? I came with absolutely nothing, no notes, nothing. And I was honest. I said, listen, they asked me to give a lecture about Islam and science. And I want to be honest. I know nothing about, it's about science. I know absolutely nothing about science and Islam. But I have a question. We are criticized as Muslims because we believe in God, whom we call Allah, 
and we believe in the Quran based upon faith. And some people say it's misguided. How can you believe in a God you can't see? How? And a book that came from something you can't see? How can you believe in that? But I have a fundamental question. And if anybody here can answer this question, I'm willing to change my religion. Whoa! High stakes now, yes? So all the secular atheists and the humanists, they're rubbing their hands, yeah? Because they think they have a convert. They can say to me, answer my question, and I will become a non-believer. I said very, very, one question, simple question. Who here has seen an atom? Everybody started looking at each other. I said, who here seen the atom? Can someone tell me, yeah? Hands up. I've seen it. Okay. I waited. Nobody put their hand up. Surprise, surprise. I said, who here knows somebody who's seen an atom? So it's not you. Somebody's seen an atom. Again, everybody's like, look it. I said, who here knows somebody who knows somebody seen an atom? And everybody was staring. I said, who here believes in atoms? You know when you got that crazy teacher, everybody's like, how do I answer it? Yes? I said, Muslims, don't worry. Allah talks in the Quran. Whoever does an atom's weight of good, you can raise your hand. So the Muslims like slowly start raising their hands. Yes? But I said, look at this. You, on your fundamental, the atom, which is at the center of physics, the center of chemistry is the atom. What is the molecular structure that you force us to study and learn? Am I right? Back home, you had to remember every molecular structure. What happened if you didn't learn it, Chef? What happened? Dash! Am I right? Yeah? And your chemistry teacher was merciless. Am I right? They beat it into you. And in physics as well. You learn about the atoms and theories based upon the atoms. Am I right? And if we didn't memorize it, what happened? Dash, isn't it? Yes? But look at this. Where did it come from? They believe this thing on faith. They can say, okay, we know the atom exists because of its reaction. Okay, why don't we say it's a small little man? A tiny, tiny man you can't see. He causes that reaction. That's a good theory, isn't it? Isn't it? Why do you to scout one and accept the other? Based upon what criteria? What criteria do you accept one and discount the other? And so, some people using Western European scientific method, they then say the jinn don't exist. Yes? The jinn don't exist. Then we have the other extreme of person. The other extreme of person who try to make out the jinn, not only do they exist, but they are more than their existence. They are like angels. They are like angels. Or they are like a creation or a creature that is beyond the capability of the jinn. The jinn is a creation like ourselves. That like ourselves with our knowledge and intellect, we can accept Allah and go to paradise by believing correctly and doing righteous deeds or we go to the hellfire and here's a side point I find absolutely amazing if you are a magician and you do and you use magic or when I was young that's another story you do things like the Ouija board yeah and you see the cup moving in the Ouija board don't you say to yourself, if something moved this, there must be a creator. If I'm doing magic to win the lottery, and I'm getting the, I'm getting the money and I'm, I'm all blinged up and everything. Won't you say the magic that I'm doing and I'm making this money, wa alaikum wa rahmatullah, there must be a creator. Because what you're doing points to a creator. doesn't point to there not being a creator, isn't it? It points to a creator. No, that it doesn't point to a creator. And so, the thing, brothers and sisters, so we find many modern day people, 
especially those people who are afflicted. They have an affliction from the West. When they look at the West, they see a large, tall giant like Gulliver. And they look in the mirror, they see a small little man from Asia or Africa. Small little man. So when they look at the West, the first word that comes out of their lips is but but buana. <laughs> yes? And we find many of these people in our society. Because we're in the Muslim, in, in the masjid, I won't use a terminology I call them outside the masjid. Yes? But let's let's use a word for them. A gentle word. These people who are coconuts. Can I use that in the masjid? That's alright, yeah? I won't offend anybody. Yes? A coconut. That they, everything Buana says, has to be the truth. Yes? Those slaves of the West, they will even say that the jinn are microbes. Small bacteria. La hawla wa la quwata illa billah. You see this when you read some of the translations of the Quran. He's bending over backwards to accommodate Western science. Bending over backwards. If you read some of the footnotes of the Yusuf Ali Quran, you see that. You see that. Bending over backwards to accommodate the West. Why can't we have our own culture where we believe in what we believe? We are African and Asian people and from other parts of the world. We have our own traditions. Am I right? Why is it that it's not acceptable to have our own tradition? Why? Why is it we must always leave our traditions for Buana's tradition? But when Buana is our country, do you ever see Buana dressed like you? Do you ever see Buana in Tanzania wearing a dashiki, wearing the hat? Do you ever see Buana do that? The only time Buana looks like us is when it's Halloween. When it's Halloween costume time, that's when you see Buana looking like us. She'll wear a sari because it's Halloween. Ha ha ha. But you never see them. You ever see in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, when Buana comes to our country, they dress like us. Do you ever see that? But then when, they come, when you come to their country, they want you to dress like this. Is that fair? Is that fair? So brothers and sisters, my point here is, we, one of the things that we need to take out of our minds, and it's deep in our minds, is this inferiority complex we have. It's a sickness. It's worse than cancer. Because a man can have cancer and he will die. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He will die upon Tawheed. But somebody can have this inferiority complex and he will live and he will die feeling that Islam has to be remolded in the way of the West. As if they have the solution to our problems. They haven't got a solution to their own problems. How do they have a solution to our problems? We have knife crime here. Where's the solution to knife crime? We have underage pregnancy. Where's the solution to underage pregnancy? We have racism, anti-Semitism. Where's the solution to those things? They can't solve it themselves. So we're going to adopt their traditions blindly. But here comes the Muslim. We are a unique people. All the rubbish we take on board. So our girls want to be like Cardi B. Our boys want to be like Young Thug. That's what we want to be like. What's my proof? Go to any place where you find young Muslim boys. I double dare you to find someone with his trousers around his waist. Do it. Everybody's sagging. I double dare you, where they're Muslim boys, grab his headphones and listen to what he's listening to. Have you done that before? No? I double dare you. The other day I said to somebody, a young Muslim girl, where's hijab, everything, religious family. There's me, Talib, the, you should call me Talib the Naive. There's Alexander the Great, there's Talib the Naive. She's wearing headphones. I said to her, what are you listening to? Quran.
Maher Zain, and Ashid. <laughs> what are you listening to? Who can guess what she was listening to? Rihanna. Nah. Tupac Shakur. Nah. Rihanna. Nah. Beyonce. You guys will never get it. Beyonce. She's into tech three trap music. That's deep, isn't it? What is that? Yeah, even myself, I'm like, what is that? I know trap music is what all those gangster rap people and those people from who listen to rap music listen to. That's what she's listening to. You know, sometimes you see a man in rags, but he's a multi-millionaire. Sometimes you don't look at the costume and judge. Sometimes what's inside is sometimes important. And this is the reality. This is the reality of our young people. And oftentimes we have two problems. The problem is, when it comes to the good things of the West, nah, now that fam, we leave the good things. All the rubbish, pour it on, pour it on. Our young people, sometimes we forget, your brain is not, your, your, your brain is not a dustbin. A dustbin is where you put all the rubbish, not in this thing here. We find ourselves filling our brains with all the rubbish. Excuse me. Filling our brains with all the rubbish. So they go to school, rather than learning about science, chemistry, math, English, geography. They leave all those things and they study the things they shouldn't learn. How to smoke, how to drink, pull your skirt up, take your hijab off. Take your trap, pull your trousers down, show your boxer shorts. Today, well I saw a young Muslim boy, it was embarrassing. His trousers were here, I could see his black box, boxer shorts. So all the rubbish, that's what we pick up. All the good things, loud that fam. That's our motto. But we have a legacy, a history to be proud of. And that legacy and history will make us accept our religion and affirm who we are. And so, going back to the point, some people they say, the philosophers, that the jinn are evil inclinations in your soul. They say the jinn doesn't exist, but it's an evil feeling in your soul. By the way, this is what the Church of Satan promotes. They say, look, the devil is not something that's alive. Don't be silly. The devil is that thing that stops you being yourself. Look at that. But what is goodness then? is when you are free to do whatever you want to do. That's goodness. And evil is that what stops you being who you want to be. And that's what we see from the young kids today. Isn't it? The young kids today, they have this thing in their mind, they are free to do whatever they want to do. Are we really free? Are we, are we really free? No. When you want to practice Islam, all of a sudden they call you a terrorist. Even though you have nothing to do with ISIS. But when I want to drink, take, smoke weed, go partying, don't pray, then I'm free. How is that freedom? Freedom. And so, some people are the philosophers, some people are Muslims, a small number, they deny the existence of the jinn. Some of the people of shit, the polytheists, they say, the jinn are the souls of the planets. Some of the philosophers, they say that the jinn is an evil inclination. We have some people who are from the Muslims who say that the jinn are simply microbes. All of these deniers deny the existence of the jinn. However, the jinn, if we look in the Kitab and the Sunnah, are there and they exist as a separate creation. And these people rather, they speak with no knowledge. And how many people we find on YouTube speak without any knowledge? When you go on social media, they're talking about all aspects of the religion with no knowledge. So we have somebody who teaches the explanation of the Quran. Who taught him the explanation of the Quran? We used to have back in the 90s, a particular Imam who said that his Shaykh, Allah gave him ta'wil of the Qur'an. Allah gave him the explanation of the Qur'an. And you know what this, this Imam used to do in the 70s? 
I don't know if I should say it. You won't believe me. This imam in the 70s is documented with his other imams. He was like a chief imam, a leader of their community. He would have meetings with the other imam. And they would look at movies and give tafsir explanation of the movie. <laughs> I'm not lying, we're lying. I always say reality is stranger than fiction. So they would say, for example, Superman. The cape means knowledge. The S means light. Do tough sale movies. <laughs> and this imam is recorded. I have, I have a recording of myself against this imam. Against this imam. Say the same statement. That his imam was given ta'wil of the Quran. Allah gave him the explanation. He could open any, open the Quran and give explanation. Where did he get this from? He claimed from Allah, like the Sufi mystics do. The mystics, look at this. Look at this. Sufis say Allah gives them knowledge of the Quran. Am I right? What do Christians say? Where do they get knowledge of the Bible from? God or Jesus, isn't it? Isn't that a link? Go meet those Protestants. They say, God has given me the understanding of the Bible. Everyone has their own personal understanding of the Bible. Have you heard that before? Brother smiling. Am I right, isn't it? Yes? Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit. You're right, yes. The Holy Spirit comes into me and I get the tongues and... <laughs> Here's a question. I have a big question. They say, when you get into the Spirit, you start speaking tongues of the angels. Am I right? Yes or no? Yeah? yeah. yeah? Where's the alphabet of the angel? Where's the alphabet? Show me the alphabet. Show me the dictionary. So when I hear you speak in tongues, I can then look to the dictionary to see what the word means. Who's ever documented in the Bible? Your scripture, their scripture. The language of the angels. So how do you know you're speaking the language of the angels? It's like somebody say, I speak Kiswahili. And I say, what well, sounds like Kiswahili? Isn't it? I can make it sound. Yes? I can make a sound like words like Jonono. Yes? <laughs> it sounds like Kiswahili to somebody who doesn't know. Am I right? Yeah? I can say I, I'm speaking Arabic. Mahaka yeah? <laughs> It sounds to us so dumb. Isn't it? Yeah? But if you don't know, what would you say? Wow. 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 My man knows Arabic, you know, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, my man knows Kiswahili, <laughs> isn't it? You have people do that on YouTube. They speak languages. I speak Kiswahili. Hamaja <laughs> Naha. People are like, yeah. The man knows it. What does that sound like to you, Kiswahili speakers? <laughs> sounds so dumb, isn't it? Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Sounds so dumb. Kirabish, <laughs> yes. But brothers and sisters, this is the danger of speaking about the religion with no knowledge. Allah tells us in Surah to Yunus, the 39th verse, Bal kathabu bima lam yuhitu bi ilmi. Rather, they deny that which they have no knowledge thereof. And so we, Walillahi alhamd, Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'a, we are in the middle course. We are not from those people who deny the jinn, neither are we of those people who say the jinn are other than what they are. So we don't say they're microbes, we don't say they're planets, we don't say they are stars, we don't say any of these things. We say they are creation. And Ibn Taymiyyah, he says a very, very long quote, which I'll only give a couple sentences of. He says, None of the different groups of the Muslims had differed about the existence of the jinn. Nor in fact that Allah sent Muhammad as a messenger to them also. The majority of the different groups of the unbelievers also confirmed their existence. And the people of the book from amongst the Jews and the Christians also accept their existence in the same way as the Muslims do. Even though one may find some among them who will deny their existence. But this is a modern day thing. Up until recently, people would believe in God. Am I right? It was a 
a, 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 a done thing to believe in God. Whether you're a Jew, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, whatever. But now today we find people, even the time of the Prophet وسلم, we spoke about this. That the mushriks would affirm the rububiyah of Allah. That was an accepted. Today what do we find? We find people, and it's something that we should talk about later on. That people deny the existence of Allah. And what do they put in, in place of Allah's existence? If it isn't evolution, what do we call it? The? What do we call it? The? Uh -uh, the? No? Uh -uh, the? <laughs> what is it termed in the literature? The? Theory of evolution. Am I wrong? They themselves call it the theory of evolution. And that's interesting. It's a theory. So if they don't put it with the theory of evolution, so we all come from uh, some primate that has not been found, some animal or something that existed, then primates, monkeys branched off one way, and then humans branched off the other way. I won't say my thoughts and theories because I might be labelled, but maybe some people, their ancestors indeed came from monkeys, ours didn't. Yes? <laughs> Alhamdulillah, we have thousands, not millions of years of civilization in the African continent where we come from. Am I right, brothers? Yeah. I can't speak for other people because they, their history is not as long as our history. You go to India, which includes Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and India as we know it, we have hundreds of thousands of years of history. Am I right? Wherever you go, you find ancient civilization. As for other people, Allahu Alam, yes? But they replace this. This today we find some people deny the existence of supernatural and they affirm other types of supernatural. So they say God doesn't exist, but they believe in superstitions like black cats, uh, four leaf clovers. Don't you find it strange in a country which most people are either claim to be atheist, that's they don't believe in God's existence, or agnostic, they don't say he exists or he doesn't exist that we have the star signs in the newspapers. Isn't that strange? Or not strange? Very strange. Isn't that strange? Because the belief in the stars affecting us is an ancient mystical belief. Do the stars affect us? No. Unless you're a werewolf. <laughs> Are you anybody from the twilight zone or something like that here? No. <laughs> doesn't affect us. But people who claim to be agnostic or atheists Things like these superstitions, they believe in. So you go to America, you go to the 11th floor, 12th floor, 14th floor. Why? Aren't you supposed to be? 13. Uh, no 13. No 13. Why? Why? If your people are atheists or agnostic, why would you be scared of an unlucky? Would you have an unlucky number? No. So this is the thing. So they replace this rumor be of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with either atheism or they affirm <clears throat> supernatural, supernatural uh, beliefs about things that they claim to have power. Now, let's look in the Quran and the Sunnah about the existence of the jinn. Allah tells us in Surah Al-Jinn, Say, O Muhammad, it is revealed unto me that a company of the jinn, they listened. Surah Al-Jinn. That a company of the jinn, they listen to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again we find in a sixth verse of Surah Al-Jinn. So the, the chapter called Jinn shows us something significant, isn't it? Yes? That what do we learn? Allah says, And indeed, O Muhammad, individuals of mankind used to invoke the protection of individuals of the jinn. So this increased them in revolt. So we've, we studied this hadith before. And we learned that the pagan Arabs, if you remember, when they would travel out into the desert, when they go on long journeys, when they entered into a valley, Ibn Kathir he tells us that they would say, Oh, I seek refuge in the master of the jinn of this valley. But unbeknown to them, when the jinn saw them approaching, they would run far away. They would themselves be scared and run far away, Ibn Kathir tells us. But when they saw that humans were scared of them and sought refuge in them, 
they will come back and they will torment them. So when they put the fire, they will blow the fire out. They will clank, clank their pots, their pans, etc. So, this is another proof that we learn of the existence of the jinn. And so Ibn Taymiyyah also says that the hadith are mutawatir. That is, in each stage in a hadith, we have two components. The actual text called the mutton, what is, is read, and the chain of narrators called the isnad. A mutawatir hadith in each chain, so from the Prophet, from the person who narrates it to the Prophet, in each chain, in part of the chain, a large body of people have narrated the hadith and it's impossible for them to come together upon a lie. That these ahadith are also mutawatir. And we have also a number of eyewitness accounts. A number of eyewitness accounts. And there are a number of ahadith and ayat, and we just looked at a few of them, yes, because of time. There is a very famous one by Al Amish, who was a very famous scholar of the Salaf, a very famous scholar. He said, A jinn appeared amongst us. I said to him, what is your favorite food? He said, rice. We brought some to him and I would see the spoon go up and down, but could not see anyone. I said, do you also have people of desires, that is people of innovations among you like we, what we have? He said, yes. I said, what is the situation of the Rafida? And we all know who the Rafida is. And I tried yesterday with little success to download the video of the Ratsul Hussein, I will keep on doing it, yes? If you haven't seen the video of Ratsul Hussein, very important to look for that hadith, uh, that, that, that clip. He said, uh, what is the situation of Rafida, the extreme Shia among you? He said, they are the worst of us. So here's a testimony of one of the Salaf concerning an eyewitness of the jinn. So now we have shaitan or Satan and the jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned shaitan, a source of evil. Shaitan in a number of places in the Quran. And he is from the jinn. And we'll talk, we're going to talk about him in a bit of detail. What we know from the Quran is that he used to worship Allah in, at the beginning of his creation. And that he lived amongst the angels in Al Jannah. And he entered into Al Jannah. And then he disobeyed Allah when he refused to prostrate to Adam at Allah's command out of pride, arrogance, and envy. Look at that. Allah told him. Look at that, brothers and sisters. Who told him? Did I tell him? Did you tell him? Allah told him. Does he know? That Allah is the Lord of all the worlds? Yes. But look at that. Still he, he denegated this belief by not following Allah's command. So therefore Allah cast him out from his mercy. And so shaitan in the Arabic language is a general term for any arrogant rebel. For any arrogant rebel, shaitan. And so it is used in general for that one specific being because he was arrogant and he rebelled against his Lord. Used for shaitan, Iblis, is called shaitan because he was arrogant and he rebelled against his Lord. So, does he want good for us, do you think? What do you think, young blood? He wants good for us? Yes or no? No. no, he was arrogant and he rebelled. He's also called in Surah An-Nisa, Tawut, that thing which causes the worshipper to go beyond the bounds, Tawut. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah An-Nisa, those who believe and they yuqatilun fi sabilillah and they fight in the path of those who believe, they fight in the path of Allah. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Those who disbelieve, يُقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلَ tagut. And those who disbelieve, they fight in the cause of Taghut. Yes? So this Taghut is an, a word that is well known to many people on the earth. 
and it is the same lettering as the word Al-Aqad. Al-Aqad said that in his book, that Iblis is the name of Shaitan, and he's called Tarhuq because he has transgressed the limits. As I explained earlier on, we use the word Tarhuq to mean somebody who goes, who takes the worshipper beyond the bounds of the limits. Takes the worshipper beyond the bounds and the limits. And he is called Tarhuq because he transgressed the limits and he rebelled against his Lord and he tried to set himself up, and he does try to set himself up as something to be worshipped and so shaitan has despaired of any chance of mercy from Allah and that's why he has earned his name Iblis Al-Bas -al means that he has no good in him Iblis is taken from the word Al-Bas which means has no good in him as we learn Iblis is going to the hellfire but Allah has granted him respite a chance not to go now, a chance of respite. And so many of the early scholars have mentioned that his name before he disobeyed his Lord was Azazil. However, this Azazil name, there is no, there needs to be some proof from the Kitab and the Sunnah for it. But what we know is his name as Iblis. And Allah refers into the Quran of Iblis. And maybe in the future, we do a series of lectures about Iblis. Yes, in detail about Iblis. But suffice to know, brothers and sisters, that the word Iblis comes from the word Albas, which means he has no good in him. Question about the Shaitan. Is he created or not created? He's created, yes? Why do I ask this question? Because we have some beliefs like the Zoroastrians. Have you heard of the Zoroastrians? Who are the Zoroastrians? Rastafarian? No. Yeah. Not the Rastafarians, the Rastians. Who are they? We never heard of them. They're, sorry? I never heard of them. You never heard about them? They're the fire worshippers. They are one of the ancient religions in where? Iran. In Iran, yes? Iran. <laughs> in Iran, yes? There are those people who believe in two gods. A God of darkness and a God of light have an equal portion, yes, equal powers. And in India you have them called Parsis. Have you heard of Parsis before? No? Parsis. One of the traditions, the rituals of the of the of the Zoroastrians in India, and the Zoroastrians they believe you are not cremated or buried. They don't cremate or bury. What do they do? They have a special place where they put the body. And these big eagles or buzzards. You know a buzzard is like a big eagle looking bird. They start to pick your flesh away. Don't worry, you don't feel it, yeah? So they believe in, in India especially, they believe that when you die, that you put you in a special place where you leave your body and the buzzards, they come and they slowly eat your flesh away. Huh? In India, the, the Zoroastrians, they, they do this ritual. Now what was happening was somehow the buzzards were dying out. Surprise, surprise. Yes? The buzzards in India, they were dying out and they investigated and they found that some kind of disease were, were killing them and eating them away. Yes? Because the numbers were decreasing. So there weren't enough buzzards to eat people. The people were just staying there, rotting away. Yes? But they are fire worshippers, yes? And so... They believe that there's two gods, yes? The one god of fire, the one god of darkness. However, as we study the Quran and the Hadith, we find that Iblis was created, yes? As we have stated, that he is a jinn, yes? He, has, as he is a jinn. From the Quran, Allah tells us, and when we said unto the angels, prostrate yourself before Adam, they fell prostrate all except for Iblis. He, this, he was arrogant, he was prideful, and so became an unbeliever, yes? So in this verse we see that Iblis was there. He became a disbeliever because he failed to prostrate, yes? And in another verse it mentions that he was from the jinn. In another verse similar to this he mentions 
that he was from the jinn. Clearly pointing out to us that Iblis, is he a fallen angel? No. no. Iblis is a jinn. Yes? However, he was with the angels. By Allah's permission, Allah decreed for that to happen. Because he was with the angels doesn't make him an angel. And because he was cast out, it doesn't mean he's a fallen angel. This is not an Islamic belief. And so, many people though, some people, they have a, the belief that Iblis is a fallen angel and they base this on what is known as Israeliyat. Israeliyat are those narrations that are taken from the people of the book and some books of Tafsir have quoted them, not just to testify to them being truth, but to give us extra information. However, the scholars have spoken about the dangers of having of listening to Israeliyat. Because sometimes some of the beliefs of the Israeliyat may be taken from the beliefs of the Jews and Christians based upon their books, which may be incorrect. Which may be incorrect. They may be illustrative. So for example, Surah Al-Kaf, the Israeliyat may point to what was the size of the cave? What was the color inside of the cave? How many years exactly? What was the month they went in? What was the month they came out? Yes? That's what I mean by added detail. But we need to be careful. Because we can't use these as definitive proof. Yes? And so, Allah states that Iblis was one of the jinn where he said, I remember we said unto the angels, fall prostrate before Adam. And they fell prostrate, except for Iblis, and he was from the jinn. Allah says, Illa Iblis kana min al jinn fa fasaka an amri rabbi. And so, except for Iblis, he was from the jinn, and he disobeyed the order of his Lord. This is Surah Al Kahf in the 20th verse. Definitive proof. Yes? And if we take home something today, this is what we need to take home about this belief because many young people like I say they watch YouTube videos about the Illuminati who are the Illuminati? Excellent! Excellent! Where you found that YouTube? Am I right? Yeah? So you have young people taking their deen from where YouTube? Isn't it? When you listen to something and affirm it and apply it in your understanding of the deen, you're taking the deed for it. So you have you young people watching the, watching YouTube, watching that series. What's the name of that series about the Illuminati? Ah, oh, what is it called? One made by the Shia. People don't know it's by the Shia. What's it called? I forgot off my head. So they're watching these programs, these these lectures. They're watching people who are ignorant. Like what is that guy's name from Guyana? Oh, what is his name? The political one. Imran Hussein. Yes. Have you heard of Imran Hussein? Who's Jahil of the Deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes? Sunni Shia, they're all the same to him, no different. And he is a political commentator. Where does he get his knowledge about the politics from? If you check his videos of four or five years ago, listen to his predictions. He makes predictions, doesn't he? Have his predictions come to, to come, become true? No. He'll say to you, ah, oh, there's going to be a great war between Russia and America. The next minute, Donald Trump is hugging Vladimir Putin. <laughs> yeah? He'll say, oh, great, Britain's going to have a war with Saudi Arabia. Then you see the king of Saudi Arabia uh, being received by the Queen of Britain. Nonsense, absolute nonsense. He makes all these predictions. Like the Mahdi is coming. Am I right or wrong? These type of people that make predictions. Ah, oh, the Mahdi is coming. Our oh, Isa is going to come. Watch. In 2017, the Mahdi will be here. 2017 comes, it goes, and no Mahdi appeared. That's these type of people ignorant about, about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so these type of people on YouTube, they'll talk about the Illuminati. The Illuminati has a number of meanings. One meaning is about a secret society that was formed in the 1700s. Another meaning of the Illuminati is the, all secret societies. Now there are loads of secret societies, by the way. 
There's not a secret society. There are literally hundreds, not thousands of secret societies. Some of them also refer to the Illuminati to mean that group of families, the richest families in the world, particularly in the Anglo-Saxon world, that control finance and commerce. So you're watching these videos about these type of things, and one of the things they say to you is that, yes, that Satan, Satan or Shaitan is a fallen angel. But we learn, Allah says, إِلَّا Iblis, كَانَ مِنَ jinn, Except for Iblis. What was he? He's from the jinn, okay. We also learn, brothers and sisters, that the jinn and Shaitan from amongst them, they eat and drink. In Sahih Bukhari, there's a hadith that's been narrated by Abu Huraira that the Prophet ﷺ told him to get some stones in order for him, the Prophet ﷺ, to clean himself from defecation. As you know, you can clean yourself with stones as well as water from defecation. Yes? So, the Prophet ﷺ told Abu Huraira, do not bring me bones or dung. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he asked the Prophet وسلم, why he specifically mentioned not to bring those two items. The Prophet وسلم, told him that they are the food of the jinn. Yes, bones are from the food of the jinn. And he explains, a delegation of Nasib came to me and what nice jinn they are and asked me about their provisions, that's their food. I supplicated to Allah for them that they would never pass by dung or bones except that they would find meat upon them. It is also recorded, brothers and sisters, in the Sunnah of Al Tirmidhi with an authentic chain that the Prophet ﷺ said, Do not clean yourselves with dung or with bones, for they are food for your brothers amongst the jinn. And in Sahih Muslim, it's also recorded from a hadith. Narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud that the messenger, from the, uh, messenger that a messenger from the jinn came to the Prophet وسلم, and he went with them. The Prophet وسلم, read to them some Quranic verses. The Prophet وسلم, showed the people the remains of their embers, that is the fire. They asked the Prophet وسلم, about their provisions and he told them, every bone on which the name of Allah has been mentioned will have meat on it for you. And the dung of the fodder for your animals. So we learn from these hadith two important things. The first thing that the bones are for who? The jinn. The jinn. The the they say bismillah, food appears on it, meat appears on it. And that there the dung is fodder for their animals. So the jinn have animals, okay. The jinn have animals. In which they eat, which they eat from the, 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 the dung. An important side point here, brothers and sisters. In, the hadith, in Sahih Muslim, a very important hadith has been narrated by Ibn Umar. That the Prophet told us, وسلم, أَحْدُكُمْ, if one of you eats, فَلْيَأْكُوا بِيَمِينِهِ so if one of you eats, then let him eat by his right hand. And if he drinks, then let him drink by his right hand. For indeed the shaitan, the devil, he eats with his left hand. Left hand. And he drinks with his left hand. This is a very, very important thing, brothers and sisters. Because we see us as Muslims being extremely lackadaisical in this. You see young Muslims when they drink like this. They drink how? With their left hand. Imagine, you enter your house, no bismillah, who comes behind you? Shaitan. Shaitan. You, you drink and eat, no bismillah, what happens? Who's drinking and eating with you? Shaitan. Shaitan. And you drink with your left hand, who you like? Shaitan. Shaitan. Look at that. Shaitan eats and drinks with his left hand. So, wa rahmatullah. So we have to be aware of this, brothers and sisters, and to encourage our young people, our children, to grow up when they eat. Notice when they eat, to eat with their right hand and drink with their right hand. Yes. So the Prophet told us in another hadith 
Man akala bishimale, whoever eats with his left hand, akala mahu shaitan, then the shaitan eats with him. Man shalaba bishimale, and whoever drinks with his left hand, shaitan drinks with him. Look at that. So imagine, comes into your house, and when you drink and eat with your left, he's drinking with you. So don't feed him anymore. Starve him. Eat and drink with your right hand, yes? And so, the hadith that we know is a hadith which we mention time and time, and every week we emphasize this hadith for us to make it part of our sunnah. And so, from those things that we also find, that many of the scholars, they speak about this drinking and eating, but one of the important points I'd like to possibly end on, you have a little bit of time, is do the jinn marry and procreate? Do the jinn marry and procreate, yes? And as I promised you at the end of this series of lectures, at the end, I'm going to read to you from the exorcist tradition that will blow your mind, so to speak, yes? So, we find in Surah Al-Rahman, Therein are those of modest gaze, whom neither man nor jinn will have touched before them. From this hadith, this ayah from the Quran, Surah Al-Rahman, a number of ulama say that the jinn indeed, they procreate, they have children, and like us, they marry, yes? Here comes a very important point. Marriage between the jinn and humans. We have heard stories of people marrying the jinn. Am I right? There's recently a Somali man. Allah wa iya. Yes. I'm sure most of us have seen him. He said he had children with the jinn. Have you seen that? No? What about back home? Have you heard people say they've married the jinn? They have girlfriends. They have girlfriends from the jinn, yes? billah min shaitan rajim as if doing haram with a jinn makes it eat okay. Because it's a jinn, it's all right, yeah? The same mentality people have, if I have a girlfriend who's not Muslim, it's all right. It's not Muslim, so it's not a zina. Yes? It's the same mentality, yes? However, Ibn Taymiyyah says, human have, and jinns have gotten married and had children. This has happened often and it is well known. Yes? However, brothers and sisters, it is not permissible. Why? Because we are a species, they are a species. If a man called you to their house and he said, I want you to do a religious ceremony to marry me to, uh, to, to a female. Yes? And he said, I will donate to the masjid a hundred pounds. So the imam of the masjid gets the marriage certificate, gets himself ready, goes to the house, Knocks on the door, opens the door, man says, come, my wife-to-be will come in a second. So the imam goes in the front room, he served tea, sits down there waiting, in comes the man with the dog. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> would you say bismillah? Huh? <laughs> would you say bismillah? <laughs> would you say bismillah? <laughs> Would you be tempted by the money? <laughs> Gone money mad? 100 pounds? Can you give it to the masjid? No, masjid doesn't need that money. Yes? Because this is a human and that is a dog. Now we may find this to be Mr. Brother Tyler being bombastic. You're just going over the top. Am I right? Yes? But this type of relationship happens in parts of Europe. In Germany today, they have brothels for, for animals. It is legal for somebody to have relations with an animal in Germany. Legal! To my knowledge, in this country, it's illegal. If you're caught, alhamdulillah, some sense still remains in our great country of ours, yes? <laughs> yes? If you're caught, you can be prosecuted. And you know how they love animals in this country. You get me? Especially doing something like that with an animal. You'd be surprised that the person lives before he can go to court. Some people kill him before he goes to court. But it's not amazing to hear such, such, such type of things. 
in the newspaper, on the internet I read, an American woman is being prosecuted. Why? Because she saw a young man raping a dog. And she pulled the gun out on him. Well done to her! To stop him! And to save that poor innocent animal, can't speak for itself. And she's being prosecuted. Can you imagine that? She didn't want to shoot the guy, but to stop him doing his evil actions. And so she's the one being prosecuted, and the abuser of the animal is the victim. Subhanallah. This is the type of world we live in. And so, the jinn are a creation, and we are a creation. Allah says in Surah al Rum, and of his signs is this He created you, mates from yourselves, that you may find rest in them. And he ordained between you love and mercy. This verse is very, very important in this day and age. Very, very important in this day and age. Why? Ah, because we kind of lost the road these days. We seem to think that men with women or women with men are just supposed to be bystanders who say hi to each other and walk by. We seem to forget that this verse points to Allah made men and female as ideal mates for each other. This is the asal. Some people try to argue there is a third gender. Someone, I had a debate this week with somebody, they said, in the Quran there's a third gender. I said, where? Show me the verse. Al-Mu'minun wa Mu'minat. That's what Allah says. The believing men, the believing women. Yes or no? Does Allah say, al mu'minin wa Mu'minat wa Muhammad or something else? No. But this is what people try to believe. This is what people try to make you believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us, men and women, for each other to give mutual love for each other, to find rest and pleasure with each other. Nothing else. In terms, and I'm talking in a legal way, a legal way, in terms of Islamic law, for an Islamic marriage to be valid, you have to have a male and a female. It can't be a male human and a female jinn. It can't be a human female and a male jinn. It's got to be human male, human female. These are from the conditions, Islamic law, not what I said. I'm a nobody. This is from the, what the ulama have said. And so, the ulama have spoken against these type of liaisons, which they are not, they are not from, they're not from the Kitab and the Sunnah, yes? And so, from that verse, we learn that it's not permissible for a human being to have any type of relationship, intimate relationship with the jinn. Another question, do the, 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 the shayateen or do the jinn, they die? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in Surah Al-Rahman, everyone that is therein will pass away. There remains but the the wedge of your Lord of might and glory, which is it of the which of it of the favors of your Lord do you deny? So everything will be disappear, will perish. So even the jinn they will perish, and the exception to the establishment of the day will be shaitan because he will be given respite. But everything will die. I will die, you will die, and the jinn that are alive will die. We also learn from the Sunnah. That the Prophet ﷺ said, I seek refuge by your glory, the one whom there is no other deity that deserves to be worshipped but you, who does not die, and the jinn and mankind do die. So we learn from the Sunnah. The Prophet told us, Well jinn wal ins you me tun, that the jinn and the mankind we do die. Also, we learn from the Quran and he said about him, about Iblis, reprieve me till the day when they are raised from the dead. He said, lo, you are of those reprieved. 
So here this verse tells us, as, I, as I've been saying, that shaitan, Iblis has been given reprieve. He's been allowed to live. When others die, he's allowed to live. By who? The one who created him until the day of resurrection. Yes? And we seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. This brings us to the end of our first session about the jinn. Inshallah ta'ala, what we'll do next week, we'll bring some more points about the jinn and that will probably be our last lesson about the jinn. The reason I want to speak about the jinn in detail is because there's many misconceptions. Many misconceptions, especially our young people who are watching television, they're watching programs, they're watching films. Even I ask this question today, what's an avatar? What's an avatar? People are sitting there smiling, yeah? Because I know you all watch the film, yes? But what is an avatar? An alien. An alien which might be control. Ah, so that's the film, am I right? What is an avatar though? A character on the internet, yes? No? What's an avatar? In the Hindu religion, they believe in one God. Yes? But this God manifests itself. It goes into, it takes on forms. So sometimes it takes on a form, it's called an avatar. Yes? It goes into things. So sometimes God appears as Krishna. God appears as Rama. You know Rama, isn't it? Yes? As Shiva. All these different types of gods. Sometimes... God is in human beings. They believe in the Brahmin. You know the Brahmin caste, the top caste are incarnations of God. Yes? And we are at school hearing these things. And some of these beliefs we take, we adopt, we take them on board. And nobody there because we don't ask to correct them. And that's why we went into some details. So next week, inshallah ta'ala, we'll look at some very important points about the jinn. Maybe we'll bring that to a close. Now to open the floor for any questions or clarifications. Sisters, if you have any questions, please write them down and pass them through to us. Ah, do you have a question? Ah, uh, if I can answer. Bismillah. Uh, I just wanted to explain one word this black man means. 